On the topic of emergency funds, a lot of discussion around that right now in the financial world with certain financial pundits. There's a lot of people talking about debt, which is a huge conversation, how to tackle it, how to resolve it. And amongst that discussion, we are hearing a lot about emergency funds. So I'm, I'm looking forward to jumping in the, into this. And why not just ask the question, should people have emergency funds? What's the common recommendation for emergency funds? And maybe is there a better way? Yeah. People today should be setting aside six months of their uh, income or at least expenses for emergency funds. And most people are, are doing that in a bank account. You might get a little bit more aggressive and perhaps have some of that money in bonds or mutual funds, but a true emergency fund should be liquid. You could be sitting on some cash in your home, right? Cash under the mattress or in a safe, a uh, savings account, even checking, checking accounts. But the idea is to have some reserves because you never know what's going to happen. You can also hedge with other things. We don't know what's coming down the pipeline, but I've got clients that talk about, hey, I've got silver, I've got gold, I have some cryptocurrency in case, you know, of whatever. But six months of reserves for expenses in case something goes wrong. And when we say wrong, it could be a health issue, you lose your job, something happens in the family financially, the passing of a loved one or the passing of a breadwinner. But think about that six months of expenses so that you have safety, you have protection for you and your family. Yeah. And, and I can say that I've learned that this is super important. When you're a homeowner, you know, you, you have all sorts of things pop up. And this year I got to deal with my washing machine blowing out on me and then having a, a flooded basement. So having that extra capital handy allows me to, uh, you know, take care of business and not sit here with, you know, water damage and everything else. Insurance does cover it, I thank goodness. But, you know, you, you never know when these emergencies are going to happen. And it's not like insurance is super fast and going to re, uh, return your money to you when you actually need it. You know, they take their sweet time. So having an emergency fund for unexpected things, you're, you're talking about home maintenance, medical, you, know, you might lose your job or say you're an entrepreneur, you got your business going and uh, things are slow, you can tap into your emergency fund for that. Obviously, you don't want to be using your emergency fund for a night out. You don't want to use your emergency fund to uh, to go on vacation. So you really need to have this emergency fund and then be disciplined with what you spend the money on. Yeah, Jason, that's huge because we as human beings, we have the propensity to spend. I'll talk to people making a half a million dollars a year and people making a 100000 a year and they both might feel broke. But the fact of the matter is we have to be disciplined because our propensity to spend, we make more money, we wanna spend more money, but we need to be in control to make sure that we have these different buckets of money lined up in case of an emergency. Absolutely, so let me just point something out here then. So, you know, the lack of planning leads to all sorts of issues. Probably the most is the fact that when an emergency strikes and we don't have an emergency fund, you know, what do you, what do you guys think the typical American thing to do is? The old credit card. Right. So we, we get into credit card debt. And uh, I ran some uh, stats here and some interesting things. You know, if you're under 35, the credit card debt for, well, let's say, let's go Gen Z. Let's just start at the bottom here. Gen Z, average credit card debt, 2,800. I, when you see, that's uh, one of the lower numbers here. 25% though increase over the last year. Hmm. Millennials, 5,600, 23.4% increase over the previous year. Gen X with the highest, $8,000 on average credit card debt. Boomers, 6,200, 34% of 65 to 74 uh, carry the debt. So 34%. Uh, silent generation has about 3,300 and they're the lowest debt increase at 4.4%. So. I mean, what does that tell you right there? Right. And a lot of the common, there's a lot of the, the common, you know, recommendations around emergency funds come from people that are counseling people to get out of debt. There's a couple of notable ones I'm not going to mention, but, uh, and, and so Barry, when, and when, with what you guys are talking about, there's a lot in there, right? You mentioned people might have gold, they might have crypto, it needs to be liquid. Jason is a great example with, you know, an actual emergency that happened to you and required quite a bit of out of pocket up front. So, when you have an emergency fund, I, I think I think the pundits would probably say, "Well, you need to just have it in a savings account." You know, um, do you, is it okay to have it in assets? 
what's your recommendation, in particular to you, Barry, because you deal with a lot of people, and, and we're going to we're getting to a point that there's a great way to have an emergency fund that offers a lot of things that maybe a lot of other sources don't. Yeah, the recommendation is safe, a savings account or cash, and three to six months. That's what I personally do. Got cash in a safe and money in a bank. But I also want to address what Jason mentioned with credit cards. If you look at this debt, whether it's $3,000 of credit card debt or $10,000 of credit card debt, it's not just the amount of debt, it's the interest that's being charged on the debt. I would dare say that most of those credit card debt amounts probably have interest that's being charged between 24 and 33%. So if you take a $10,000 credit card bill and you're making your minimum payment of say $100 a month, every three years, that $10,000 is doubling because of the interest, 33%. Right? And Barry, it's, it's staggering. And when we're talking about interest, like what does a credit card company do? Is that simple interest? It, it's, it's compounding on the total volume, right? But so Isn't it amortized someone, as well? Yeah, so if someone pays $100 towards their $10,000 credit card bill, you might only have 20 or $30 of that going to pay down the principal. The rest is going to interest because of the amortization. And I heard Mark Cuban say something just a few weeks ago. He said, the wealthy, the rich, the first thing they do is pay off debt that is not productive. You get rid of the consumer debt. You get rid of the debt that isn't creating revenue for you. Because a lot of wealthy and rich people have debt, but it's good positive debt that's providing cash flow. And he made this comment. He said, you know, if you pay off a 33% credit card, it's as if you earned a 33% return that year. You know, and, and what's funny is a lot of these people, they might be paying 24 or 33% interest on their credit cards, but then they're still contributing to a 401k or IRA, barely making five, six or 7%, right? So it's a losing game. They should probably stop contributions to a 401k or IRA, pay off the debt, pay off your 30% credit card, get that 30% return, and then consider saving and investing. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot so, of people don't think about it. They have 10, 15, 20,000 worth of credit card debt, and they're just leaving it there and continuing to make their contributions. Right. So Barry, uh, what is something that you recommend to people with credit card debt, like especially the higher up people that have a lot of credit card debt? calling the company. I know that there's things you can talk to the company about. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people are, and I'm going to say this kindly, are ignorant relative to what's happening with their credit card bill. I recommend get on it, right? This is an actionable step you can take right now. Get on the phone, call your company at their 800 number and ask them some questions. What is my annual percentage rate? What am I actually being charged? In addition to that, Am I paying an annual fee? Are there other transaction fees that I'm paying? Because if it's 33%, you might find after the fees you're paying and the annual renewal, et cetera, et cetera, it might be 40% that you're paying. So you can either ask to remove some of the fees or threaten, hey, I'm going to go with another company and you can do a balance transfer, et cetera. But you've got to call your credit card company and find out what are you being charged? Because I would dare say that 90 plus percent of people out there don't know. And that's a huge problem. If you don't know what's happening with your own money and your own credit, you're never going to get it fixed. So take that actionable step today. Call your company and get some answers. And so having an emergency fund is, the, is a way to avoid unnecessary bad credit card debt. So Barry, how much do you advocate for budgeting? Because, I mean, if you don't know where your money is going, then you, you're putting it on credit cards and this and that. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Well, the safe thing always is to save 10% of your gross income. I mean, that's, that's the safe thing to do. And then manage your expenses wisely. But let me bring something up that comes from Robert Kiyosaki out of his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's this principle. This is a financial principle. Listen up. Your ears should perk up at this moment. The financial principle is pay yourself first. The reason you pay yourself first is because you're more important and your family's more important than the utility bills, the credit card bills, the Friday night dinners, the expenses elsewhere. Pay yourself first. Then what's left over, spend as you need to spend. And look, if you find at the end of the month, you don't have enough money 
cut the expenses. Get rid of the streaming subscriptions. You've probably got a gym membership that you might not be using or other memberships like that that are just leaking money out of your account every single month. 10% is safe. But I tell clients with what we do, if you want to get aggressive, you can save 20, 25%. And in some cases, you can funnel 100% of your income through some assets that we recommend to really help propel, propel your wealth and increase essentially your overall assets. That's excellent. The reason I asked the budgeting question is, you know, I think a lot of times we think we know what our monthly expenditures are. You know, we, we kind of assume, well, I'm spending this here, I'm spending that there. But, you know, when doing a budget, has done a couple things for me. One thing is I really see my what's coming in and what's going out. And that's an important thing. I run my budget like I'm running a business in my life. So I'm an entrepreneur, so I do my own business and uh, I run my finances like a business. If I go broke, that doesn't help me as an entrepreneur. So I need to know where my money's going in my business, but also in my own life. But it also like when you start budgeting, you you start seeing what you're spending and it, and it changes kind of how you spend. So if I'm going to weekly go out and buy some consumable good that I like, you know, I'm paying $5 for a cup of coffee. I could just make it at home for 50 cents, if even that. Um, but if I'm spending $5 a week and now I'm doing a budget, well, it's $20 a month and I times that by 12, now I'm doing $240 a year in coffee. Like it's yeah. just, when you start doing those things, you start seeing how the little things add up. And then if I do an opportunity cost, and I started thinking about, well, what can I do with $240, you know, a year? Well, what if I put that in you know, whatever, like some sort of investment? And uh, it kind of changes how you look at things and you, you're not so frivolous with your money. Yeah. And, and if you're going to Starbucks two or three times a week, you're spending probably 8 to $12 every time. And now you're 2000 a year in coffee or more, right? It's, these little things add up. So I like what you're saying, because when you look at it from a weekly perspective, a monthly perspective, and an annual perspective, you step back and say, oh my gosh, 10 grand just left my bank account because of all these silly things that I'm doing. It, to me, what you guys are talking about is kind of like when you're counting carbs and if you get on a keto diet or something and you start tracking that, and then you realize what you're, how much you're actually, like maybe either how many carbs you actually were eating before calories. or how many calories you were eating before. So I love that. I do think there's going to be a percentage of people that are kind of annoyed with this discussion because they're going to say, hey, you, know, you want to take my lattes? You know, right. I've heard people say, I, I think I'll just drink the latte. Thanks. You know, so this one, we, this been years, right? Probably a couple of decades, actually, where, you know, mm -hmm. you had different groups talking about controlling your, your costs. But what's the other side of it, guys? What can people do? Now, me, my big problem with credit cards is that it creates negative momentum, like huge negative financial momentum. Like it just starts digging you in a hole. It doesn't matter if you're making 100000 a year, you're going to feel broke, right? Because you've got this negative momentum with your finances. So for people that are like, well, that sounds pretty good. I'm still going to drink my lattes. What, what can they do? I mean, regardless, they should have an emergency fund, right? Yeah. So maybe get rid of the credit card debt or don't use it. You know, Make it super limited how you use your credit cards. But what else? What's the other side of this about momentum? Yeah, and, and I agree with you, Steve. We're not telling people to completely change their lifestyle and give up, give up things that they enjoy, but just know where the money is going. And uh, th th there's, there's a financial entertainer out there that says everyone should get rid of their credit cards. And I don't agree with that. I think that credit cards serve a purpose and you can use credit cards for good. For me, I like to pay my credit cards every month, off every month, and then I get the 2% rewards. And Dave Ramsey will say... <laughs> Don't do that. He'll say, don't even do a credit card for rewards. And he'll say, you know, you run $100,000 through there. It's two grand. Well, I run more than $100,000 a year through my credit cards. So if it's two grand, four grand, eight grand, 10 grand, that's free money to me if I'm smart about paying off those credit cards. So to your point about momentum, that's one way. I look at my credit card rewards and I'm like, hey, it's free money. I'm going to either put it towards other expenses, or I'm going to go buy a new guitar amp with that money. And basically it didn't cost me anything because the rewards. So I think what these financial entertainers are worried about are people not being disciplined with a credit card. Can a credit card be used for emergency? Yes, but that's not what we're advocating. 
We're saying right, set gonna, the cash aside. I'm going to throw one more monkey in the in the wrench, which is inflation. You know, what I believe is, and we've been hearing people talk about it, we're going to be in an inflationary environment maybe for a long time. You know, people are tightening their belts and using credit cards at the same time. So hopefully their cash flow will keep up. And that's when that cash flow starts to cycle, and then people get credit card debt, they can't pay back. So the caution, to your point, is if they're using them and then they have an issue or something, I mean, everybody wants to pay them off every month. So there's yeah. a risk there going on. Yeah, there is a risk. And, and what, what we'll say is start a business, right? Become entrepreneurial. You can keep your day job and your W-2, but having a business will help with some of this from the perspective of increased cash flow, et cetera, or more education, right? There are things that you can do for more education to in increase income or cash flow. And the momentum is important. We want people to feel a sense of empowerment here. I prefer the word or the phrase saving plan instead of budget, because saving plan to me sounds, sounds more positive. I can spend money, but where am I spending the money? How am I spending the money? So we want people to feel empowered, have a, a spending plan, a yeah. saving plan, whatever that looks like. I like to tracking. Me. I like financial yeah. tracking. For me, that one, <laughs> it just helps me maybe because I have a hard time, you know, knowing how much I'm going to spend and then keeping to those. I mean, just to be vulnerable and honest with our audience, you know, yeah. that's yeah, not, not a super analytical person. So, but I also don't really like, like sugary lattes. So that's an advantage. But the point is, you know, that can be, it can be hard to, you know, but I think tracking for me, you know, everybody's different, right? You guys might look at it differently, but um, that makes some sense to me. Just knowing what you've got going on. Yeah. Yeah. True. I think Barry, you mentioned uh, starting a business and, and, and uh, that is like a, a abundant mindset, right? To don't live within your means, expand your means, you know, just try to figure out other ways. If you're, the thing is, is, you know, the wealthy, what do they do? They, everything they purchase is through assets. So if you have an asset making you a hundred dollars a month, that's your latte asset. You know, yeah. if you can create more money, then you have the flexibility to spend more money. The problem is, is, you know, we see here that everybody's in credit card debt. So obviously they don't have enough money. Things are tight. You know, we got to think outside the box. We got to come up with solutions and um, starting a business, you know, thinking in this new economy where, you know, there's a lot of jobs are going away because of AI, but then at the same time, a lot of jobs are going to be created. Like technology has shown itself to actually be innovative and not right. uh, scarcity. You know, it, it's not taking, it's, it's just, we got to figure out where the new things are and, and then use those to our benefit. Yeah, that's human ingenuity. And we've ingenuity. always been able to adapt. That human ingenuity is powerful. There is more creation. There's more available to us from an abundance mindset. It's absolutely a true principle for that, for those types of things to come to fruition. Love it. So how do we bring abundance mindset and using some financial truths to do a better job saving? That's not even say emergency fund. That's a huge part of it, obviously, but just saving wealth, right? Storehousing wealth, stockpiling in a way that is, is going to create momentum. Yeah. Well, ask the question, what kind of future do you want to have? We've talked before about hard, easy versus easy, hard. You do the hard things now to have an easier life in the future, but what kind of future do you want to have? And, and we recommend a particular asset that we'll get to in a few minutes that you can also use as an emergency fund that does grow money guaranteed, cash is liquid, and you also have tax advantages that you don't get in a regular savings account or elsewhere. And, and that idea of having the mindset to do this. If you've got discretionary income, don't just go blow all of it. You've got to be in a mindset where you're thinking about not only your present, but what do you want your future to look like? Unfortunately, again, the propensity to spend that we have as humans is very prevalent. And you've got to you know, take stock, take note of discretionary income. What are you doing with your discretionary income to advance, to propel, to enhance your future? Right idea, a powerful question. Some people might have a hard time grappling with that. They might say, well, I want my present to be really good. <laughs> That's the whole point of people using credit cards wildly, right? It's kind of like, well, I kind of want that guitar amp now, so I'm going to just, you know. But there's but there's, there's wisdom in both. I mean, you, you want to have the guitar amp and peace of mind at the same time. Yeah, so, and, I, and I just need to bail some people out here because we are in tough economic times. So. Right. 
people listening to this might not be buying anything. They might just be going underwater because our government has decided that inflation is the key to everything. So, uh, you know, we're in tough economic times. So I understand why credit card debt is at an all time high over a trillion dollars. Um, so I just want to throw that out there because someone might be listening to this and like, this is no fault of my own. I'm just trying to stay above water right now. Yeah. Right. And that's a great point, Jason, getting abundance minded. And you still want to be thinking like, how can I have Always. financial success and abundance? So that's the hard part too. It's like, so we want to also encourage that, but I love that you're connecting with people because there's people that have taken a serious hit just because of the increase in cost of living in the last year even. So and we, and we see someone, you moms and dads out there raising your kids. We see you keep up the good fight. It's a hard time, yeah, but sure. we'll get through it. What kind of track do they want to get on? In other words, what can start to get, you know, there's one track that says, well, I'm not going to buy anything unnecessary. I'm going to cut up all my cards. I'm going to, I'm going to only pay cash and therefore I'll feel abundant eventually. That that's a, a path of the, the, the guy who you mentioned. Do we have a better way? Is there a better way to pursue that kind of abundance in our yeah. own lives? <laughs> And I want to get to that. I want to share one quick idea, which is this. <laughs> how will it feel? You're killing me here, Barry. Yeah. How will it feel, you listening, when your credit card debt is gone? Just the, the emotion of that. If you woke up tomorrow and all your credit card credit card debt went away, how would that make you feel? There's no real words or expression to really share how that would make you feel. And this is what we're talking about. Peace of mind. There's a new mindset when that will happen. And so we've said to people, hey, you are sitting on some cash. You have this particular investment or a 401k. It might be wise to use some of that money to pay off your 33% credit card so that you have peace of mind and you can function. Because look, we all know we've been in financial stress, all of us. When you have financial stress, it affects you spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Your relationships are harmed. Financial stress causes trouble everywhere else, right? Yeah. So think how that would make you feel. And are there ways and things that you can do that maybe you haven't thought of? Maybe you do have an IRA or 401k or brokerage account. You're like, man, I haven't wanted to touch that because that's my retirement. Well, if your credit card debt is drowning you and you'll feel peace of mind and you can cut up your credit cards after you pay them off and be disciplined, there are reasons to use some of those assets to pay down that debt. Now, Steve, what do we recommend? We recommend yes, finally, we're getting prefer, there. yes, what's called high cash value whole life insurance. And people might say, why would I ever consider life insurance as a saving tool or an emergency fund? I'm going to give you three main reasons, but there are 10 or 12 that we could cover. Number one, in a high cash value whole life policy, a person is getting guaranteed growth on their money. It's not subject to stock market losses. Two, the cash is liquid. You can put money into the whole life policy and use it for what we call infinite banking. Take policy loans, pay off debt, buy their assets, but check this out. You're still earning interest and dividends on your total cash value. So it's a way for you to make money in two places if you are buying assets. If you're paying down debt, it's a way for you to still be making money on your total cash value and at the same time, pay down the debt. And th I'm just going to unpack that for a second. The guys give me a hard time because I like to talk. I don't know if I really like talking that much, maybe a little bit. Barry, what you're saying is that there's a mechanism going on right now. So in other words, that you're not just picking pennies and putting them in your piggy bank or you're not putting dollars into your savings account and getting just a tiny little piece of interest and hopefully you'll save and save. There's a powerful mechanism happening that's helping you compound your money more quickly. Yeah, I call it a guaranteed investment. If you're investing in mutual funds or ETFs or a brokerage account of some sorts, most people are just speculating because they don't know exactly what's going to happen. And there is no guarantee in the stock market. These properly structured high cash value whole life policies are guaranteed to make money every year. It doesn't matter what's happening in the economy. It doesn't matter what's happening in the stock market. You will, in fact, make money every single year. And, and there's power in that because of the mechanism. Right. And I know you show that a lot in different examples. And you also show things like IRR, which we're not going to get to today, but there's plenty of webinars on it. I think because people, the reason I bring that up is people are thinking, well, what kind of, you know, first question, what kind of interest rate can I get? You know, that kind of thing. Or yeah. what kind of rate of return? So, yeah. yeah, that's true. The third benefit 
that I love and my clients love as well is that you're able to use all the growth, all the gains inside of the policy's cash value 100% tax free. So the reason tax free is so important is because we don't know what future tax rates will be. When the 2018 tax changes went in place, they went in place for only a temporary amount of time. Come January 1st, 2026, those tax changes, most of them expire. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with the new administration and how that's all going to look. But as it sits right now, tax changes will expire January 1st, 2026. Well, what does that mean for you? And inflation is a huge part of this. The government keeps printing money. Let me be clear about this. Inflation primarily comes to all of us because the government prints money. Anything else you hear, it's ancillary. Inflation comes because there's more supply in the chain. The government's just printing, printing, printing. And this money is being printed out of thin air. Don't be convinced that inflation's coming from other areas. Number one, it's coming because of printed money by the government, which is frankly ridiculous. It's very frustrating that this happens. Yeah. That's, but, another, that's another topic that we'll jump on at some point. But yeah. And, but and you're right, Barry, and your passion is money. noted and shared. That's right. Having tax-free money in your portfolio will help with some of the problems with inflation. Because if there's inflation and your taxes have to go up to pay for it, if you've got a bucket of money that's tax-free, you don't have to worry about that amount of money being taxed. So the inflation won't necessarily affect that from a tax perspective. Well, and, and yeah. just to speak to inflation, so if you're locking in, to a whole life insurance policy and you have X premiums you're, you know, obligated to pay and these are flexible. So, you know, we can talk about that as well. But when, when money is being devalued, your dollar today is worth more. So when you lock into that policy, that's your premium for the rest of your life. So as your income goes up just because of inflation, you're going to have those same dollars, you know, more of them to pay your premium. And so in a sense, like you're locking into an asset, which whole life insurance is an asset and it will help you, um, you know, you're, you're never, your premium's never gonna go up. That's right. So let's use real yeah. numbers. Let's say you're gonna start a properly structured high cash value whole life policy and you wanna use it for the infinite banking concept and you wanna put 20,000 a year into the policy. That 20,000 is always going to earn compound interest year after year. And every year that goes by, the compounding amount is always getting larger. But 10 years from now, that 20,000 isn't going to feel like 20,000 of premium. It might feel like 17. And 20 years from now, it might feel like 12 or 13. But and you're still fixed. compounding on your total. Yeah. Yeah, that was such a great point, both you guys. But Jason, to your point, I mean, buying assets, everybody says it, it doesn't matter who you're listening to about inflation. I mean, buying assets is, is, is you know, a no brainer. People don't think about a contractual asset, namely, you know, the high cash value, over, call it overfunded whole life. The detractors have, they're in a completely different stratosphere. They have no idea what they're talking about with regard to this. We talk about it a lot. And so think about it, guys, you know, buying assets. This is a financial asset. This is a contract that you're buying into, a fixed contract. It's going to just compound over many years. Those dollars are going to seem like much less in even a few years from now. We know Absolutely. That. And you get a leveraged death benefit on top of it. So, yeah. Great. Which you yeah. get the peace of mind and knowing that our loved ones are in the middle of everything else that they'll be taken care of. Yeah. And so using this policy as a source of emergency funds is a great idea. You still should have a little cash on hand at home, but I've got a lot of cash in multiple policies that can be used for emergency funds. So fast that when you call the insurance company or go online and request a policy loan, they can have that money deposited in your bank account within two to seven business days, right? Yeah. Relatively quick. It's you super don't have liquid. To we've all, we've all done, you know, and we can all attest to that, that we've taken policy loans for different things and they're, they're terrific emergency funds. I think that your, your idea that you should have some cash is pretty conservative. I don't even know if it's necessary though, to tell you the truth, but that's, that's just, you're, you're being a cautious guy and saying that, I mean, these are terrific emergency funds from my experience. 
and we can go into all kinds of stuff with those policy loans and stuff too, but we've, we've done a lot on that. We'll talk more about it in the future, guys. If you're just checking this out. Good stuff. Anything else that, that you think was, is helpful? I think, we've, I, I think we've attacked this thing pretty good. I... What strikes me about this though, is that we are on the same page with a lot of the detractors as far as financial peace is concerned. We're all driving toward the same thing. Funny thing is we have a different understanding of a very particular asset. If you're interested in this, if you're listening and you're wondering how you can get on a path to creating an emergency fund with all of these other aspects and advantages, housed in a powerful asset, I encourage you, wherever you're watching, there'll be a link below. You can schedule a one-to-one -one with Barry to look at your own numbers. Check out if you put X number of dollars over a period of time, what's that going to look like? You don't really have that advantage with any other asset that I'm aware of. So definitely encourage it. To all you listening, thank you. We wish you success, abundance, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.